Hi everyone, welcome to this interview with Della De Beer of Electric Mayonnaise. I am really excited to have her here. She's, are we going to talk a little bit about her experience in setting up the company as well as her experience of work-life balance. Ella founded Electric Mayonnaise with her, with her co-founder Neil Gander and they use their experience of their multiple years of experience both as a chef and in operations and they now help startups, business owners, food business owners and hotels in managing and running their businesses and teams effectively. And Ella's based in London and I want to say thank you very much for being here. Yeah, no problem. It's always nice to have a chat. <laughs> I think particularly now as we go into the silly season, yes. I think um, it's good to connect to people and make sure that you're still sort of keeping a bit grounded, I think. <laughs> Definitely. Um, to set a context, this is how I always sort of set a context for the interview, just to start that conversation around work-life balance, because we don't talk about it as much in the industry, even though it affects so many different areas of our life, of our lives. Um, as I've spoken to a lot of chefs and other professionals in this industry, and always it's, there's this feeling of our rota makes it impossible to achieve work-life balance. And I agree with that in a big part, but there are things that we can do for our own well-being. And from the side of the employer, there's probably the perception that it weakens the work ethic if you talk too much about balance or, um, but you pay a price when your staff are, you know, sort of working, working in the kitchen with a time, to, time bomb ticking at some other part of their uh, personal lives. So it's, they're not showing up uh, their best selves. So it affects both sides and we need to have a conversation about it. And on top of that, uh, especially in the kitchens, we have the brigade culture, which en encourages martyrdom, sacrifice. So that kind of prevents a conversation where we really look at what we need. Yeah. And by getting other people to talk about it, other people who run companies that work with hospitality professionals, you know, the conversation gets bigger and just gets more rounded out rather than my own experience and this community's experience. So. I think all of those things leave us with very little clarity on how to tackle work-life balance. So that's my reason for having this interview with you. <laughs> um, and the first question I wanted to ask was, what was your journey to creating electric mayonnaise? Um, well, I think um, both Neil and, I, Neil and I have been in the industry for a long time, sort of, I think between the two of us, close on 40 years. And I think, um, we've had very successful careers out of it. Um, you know, we've started with no industry experience. Um, we didn't get any formal education in hospitality or anything like that. And um, we wanted, uh, when we set Electric Mayonnaise up, to be able to demonstrate that to other people. So we wanted to show that it is a very accessible industry um, and that it, um, you know, if you want to be... Um, financially independent, which was very important to me when I was younger. Um, you know, if you want to sort of meet lots of people, there are some really positive things about the industry and it's openness to a lot of people that I think, um, uh, you know, people don't really tell the positive stories about. So we wanted to, uh, we set up electric mayonnaise with the, with the sort of the, the social side of it to, um, talk about the industry and to go out and promote it. And so that's where the inter-hospitality courses come out, where we um, work with sort of people who've been long-term unemployed or who have barriers to entry to work that um, we support them into the industry. Um, and we support them into good employers, because I think there's a lot of people who perhaps don't know the industry very well will apply and end up perhaps in an employer that isn't very focused on them. And I think it's important that we link uh, people who don't have the opportunities with the really good employers that we sort of lift both of those sides up so that we are only exalting the positive in the industry, I guess. That's wonderful. I love the name Electric Mayonnaise as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, um, that's completely random. It's a, it's a Japanese anime movie from um, a long time ago. <laughs> um, and how would you define a good work-life balance? I think um, I think it's a little bit about what you said, where you said that um, you know uh, rotors make it very difficult sometimes, but that's only part of the story. And I think 
when people talk to me about work-life balance, I think it's about, uh, you know, I think it's about thinking about what's important and what's urgent. I think when you have, it's Stephen Covey's habit too, I guess. Um, you know, when you work in a rotor style operation, it's, and in hospitality, which is always very busy and urgent, the urgent can take over and you can just fall into this, you know, stream of urgency and you don't prioritize what's important in your life. And then you will feel completely out of whack because you're just going with the flow and you feel out of control and not, you know, not in control of your own destiny. So I think I always say people, I always say to people, you know, take, take stock. I think the first thing is, is kind of step back and go, you know, what's important to me. And that could be something as simple as sort of auditing 24 hours of your day, but, you know, just take stock of what's important and make sure that those important things are addressed in your life. And I think you'll feel a bit more in control and balanced, I guess. Absolutely. And what was your experience of trying to strike a balance between work and your personal life when you were in the environment <laughs> before creating electric mayonnaise? Um, I mean, it's always a balancing act. I think you have to continuously go back and forth with yourself and, and, and prioritize what's important. Um, when I was in the industry, like in service most of the time, um, you know, whatever is the priorities in your life, you might not be able to tackle them every single day, but it's as long as you have a sort of bigger than yourself uh, overview of what you are trying to achieve that, and you pat yourself on the back for the little steps towards it. I think that's the kind of thing as well. If you're not, if you're just going with the flow and you're also not really acknowledging what is going well or how much closer you are stepping towards those goals or those things that, you know, your values your passions the things that you want to achieve in your life then um you know it's going to feel completely out of balance and I think for me when I was there it, you know it allowed me to do a lot of things so it allowed me to buy a house when I was really young um it you know I moved to London when I was sort of 20 so it, it also became my social circle and it allowed me to make friends and to build networks and so I think it's if those, you know, those are important things in your life that you're also acknowledging that you're hitting those goals at some point or you're getting closer towards them. Um, so, yeah, I think that's what's important. And I think you bring up an important point about um, having an idea of what those things are, the things that matter to you, your values, because we don't have place for that in the kitchen. It's just just service, just the customer, just how, what's what needs to be done. And we don't talk we don't give space for our dreams and uh, aspirations except okay maybe professional but um beyond that what's the other side of it what other hopes do you have so it's very important to have that figured out for yourself at yes least. and i think it's one of the big changes that the industry has to make um uh generally uh, from an employer point of view is acknowledging that um you know, not everyone wants to sacrifice everything. Uh, you know, we're too quick to expect 100% passion in the industry. And I think what we're finding now, particularly with the, um, the people who were coming, who are coming through into hospitality, who have never experienced the industry before and post pandemic, their priority is their family or, you know, whatever else is their situation that they are prioritizing. It might just be to make money, but that's okay as well. And I think we need to, as an industry, accept that not everyone is going to be like the next Gordon Ramsay or the next, you know, 100% commitment to the industry. Um, and we've been doing it for years with lots of people who've come through the industry. So I don't know why we, we continue to sort of delude ourselves that we're expecting, you know, we expect people to commit 100%. Um, but I think we should be more accepting of people's other aspirations in life and supportive of those. And I think if employers do that more, and address the whole person rather than just the person at work. Um, I think we would do a better job of retaining people generally. Yeah, um, I mean, during COVID, a lot of people experience what it's like to spend the whole well, time with your family and even the people who have lived with this um, norm. I almost want to use a different word like illusion, but <laughs> let's go with norm <laughs> that, you know, only, only your work matters. Everyone was forced to ask themselves like, is could there be something else? And unless the industry changes, 
we're going to lose the people who are there as we have done. Yeah, no, completely. Important point that you raised. And um, maybe we've touched on this, but how do you see the problem of poor work-life balance affecting hospitality? And also from the context of your work and your community, the people you're trying to support into hospitality? I think, it, yeah, like I said, I think it's the acceptance of the fact that actually people aren't 100% committed and aren't going to, you know, sacrifice their life for it. And I think it's understanding that and accepting that and looking at the whole person when they come in. Um, we, we are also going to have to um, overcome this massive staffing crisis that we have now. Um, and that is going to take, um, you know, people adjusting their expectations of coming into the industry, but also, um, uh, you know, employers. And I know it's very difficult. It's very easy to say this. It's difficult in practice. But, um, you know, employers not committing, especially in London, to rents that require them to milk absolutely every hour of their business and therefore then staff that. And I think the employers that are choosing to, you know, close on the Sunday, Monday or not open for lunch or are taking into account their team's ability to cope, I think are the ones that are going to be more successful. Um, until we sort of build the workforce back up, which will happen eventually, it's just going to take a while. So you're having conversations with both sides, with the people who are you're supporting into hospitality as well as the employers, because yeah, both sides. And it's difficult, you know. I, 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 I it's very, it, you know, I'm very weary of not uh, trying to dictate because as a business owner, I know what it's like. As someone coming into the industry, I know what it's like. So it's it's very easy for me to sit on the sidelines and comment, and I and I don't want to be that person. I think it's you know, it's important to, to see where you can support in order to make it happen. But um, it's, you know, uh, there are big conversations to be had generally about business and what's required, I think. Um, yeah. I mean, there are organizations like us to support with that, right? With the, we're not just talking on the sidelines and saying, commenting, but we are there to support. And that's, that's the, that's the good thing. Yeah. Um, and what is one piece of advice you would give to hospitality professionals who want to improve the quality of their lives? Take stock, I would say. Um, you know, especially if we go, you know, we're going into Christmas now, which is, you know, all craziness. Um, you know, where in your 20, how are you spending 24 hours in your day? You know what I mean? And if that is, if you are committing, you know, a 12 hour shift, for uh, for work or something, which might you know might be what's happening now between now and Christmas. Um, where do you give your space to yourself yes. on either side of that? So you know, don't spend too much time on social media. Prioritize sleep. Um, you know, look at the look at the twenty four hour day of yours, and uh, where you know there will be bits that you don't have control of, but there will definitely be bits that you do have control of. And I think particularly for the month of December. Um, focus energies on the things you do have control over um, and put some good stuff in there to, to balance it a bit. <laughs> Love that. And employers, what, was, what would be one thing that you would say to employers to support the work-life balance of their team members? Um, Empathise. I mean, you know, I would hope that most, most of them are doing that. Um, if they are, you know, if they are in any doubt that they aren't empathizing, just sit down and have a chat. I think the main thing is communicate and and keep open channels as much as possible. Um, uh, you know, if you can make changes and if you can support things that will increase, you know, um, balance and, and mental well-being, then obviously do so. But if it's really tough at the moment, which it is for most of them, just make sure that you are keeping as open a forum as possible and empathizing where you can. Um, you know, I think assumption is the mother of all uh, faults in the industry. So before you assume, I think, ask and find out. <laughs> yes, it can be just a simple conversation that feeling yeah. seen and heard is just so very, is so very special and it makes you feel like, okay, I have space for my well-being. 
who I am. There's a space for me here. It's just so, it can be very simple, like you said. Yeah. So the last question is, how can members of the Love Letters to Chefs community find electric mayonnaise and about more about your work? Um, uh, well, on our website, um, we're hello at electricmayonnaise.co.uk or um, we're also on social media. Uh, we have two accounts. We have electric mayonnaise on social media and we also have into hospitality, which is the more social enterprise side of the business. Um, so yeah, if people want to find out about the social enterprise side of it is one side, but then electric mayonnaise will do all the other stuff as well. So yeah. The Into Hospitality is the project that you mentioned where you're bringing in people to from other walks of life into hospitality? Yeah, so it's fully government funded. Um, we work very closely with the Department of Work and Pensions, so I'm long term unemployed. Um, and we uh, are working with supportive employers to make sure that uh, people coming through the program um, are in supported employment afterwards, which is... Um, which is uh, so far so good, 70% job placement rate and then 98% completion rate. And we've had over 100 people through the program so far. Um, and I think that's the only way we're gonna, you know, redevelop the skills and the, the staff shortages. And if we manage to do that, then we will be able to reduce everyone's hours and, you know, it's a sort of catch 22. So I think if we don't focus on building the next generation, um, it's gonna be tough for that. And also I'm since sort of sensing a valuable perspective, a new perspective. It's not everyone who's been trained to look at hospitality in the same way, but a different perspective and bringing their own experience and viewpoints and which is kind of missing. I think when you are in hospitality, it's everyone's come, gone through the same processes and yeah, more or less the same experience kitchens all over the world. I find through this project that they are very similar in environment, but having other people to, Change. Yeah, I think that conversation is so interesting, isn't it? We're finding there's a lot more um, uh, older people coming in. So the average age is, is like 50 plus. Wow. And that's a whole new generation of people coming into the work environment. And, you know, they bring a level of maturity and seniority. And, you know, it's lovely having them on the floor or in the kitchen. But it takes adjustment, you know, and it takes um, change in perception. So, yeah, lots of changes. But I think... Um, we, one thing we do as an industry is we, we, we do embrace, you know, different people and different ages and different, it doesn't really matter, you know, if you've got, we've had some people 80% deaf, we've had people with, you know, learning difficulties, we've had people with schizophrenia, I mean, all kinds of stuff and, um, and hospitality is able to accept them often for who they are and I think that's one of the positive stories, so if we can keep them in the industry and make sure they stay, then, you know, we can build a and accepting and um, uh, worthwhile industry, I guess. <laughs> it's a really exciting project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, thank you for your time.